Good afternoon. It is so good to be with you again today. We're continuing our study on Galatians 3 on the gospel of grace. And uh, in the last uh, two months, we've covered almost two chapters. So the last time we uh, we finished on Galatians 2.20, I'm going to uh, go back and review a little bit. And, you know, Galatians 2.20 is probably one of the most important verses in this in this scripture. Let me go to the verse before, Galatians 2.19. For though the law, to I through the law died to the law that I may law, live to God. And one of the biggest challenges, and I have so many times in this Bible study, that the biggest enemy of Christianity is not the devil, the biggest enemy of Christianity is religion. And religion always wants to tell you what you have to do to make yourself right with God. And that leads to nothing but failure. And it negates the gospel of grace. And Paul, as we saw when we started this study in Galatians chapter 1, says that if anyone preaches any other gospel, of grace which I have preached. He said, let him be a curse. And uh, as we saw in the study of Galatians, they were those so-called Judaizers that wanted to make the newly converted Christians follow all the law of Moses, follow all the rules and regulations of Judaism, and put people in bondage. You could not just receive grace. And the problem is this, if you add works and you say, yes, you're saved by grace, but you got to remain saved by your behavior or by what you do, then basically you're saying the sacrifice of Jesus was not sufficient. If you have to earn your salvation, then the cross was the biggest crime of all eternity. But the reality is, the Bible is quite clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And no one, no one can make themselves acceptable unto God because perfection of God cannot cohabit with the imperfection of man. This is why you have to realize that 2 Corinthians 5.21 has to be a reality for God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Unless he made us the righteousness of God, he could not commune with us because righteousness cannot commune with unrighteousness. We need to realize that who we were died at the cross with Jesus. And that became a reality in your life the moment you surrendered your life to Christ. Who you were died. And this is what this verse is talking about. Through the law, if I through the law died to the law that I may live to God. When we need to say it no more by what I do or don't do that I can achieve heaven. It is impossible and therefore, Paul now comes to this great, just great, great statement in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Your old nature died at that cross with Christ. Now, that becomes a reality when you surrender your life to Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But then he corrects himself. Yet not I, not who I was, because who I was is dead. But Christ who lives in me. So, yes, who I was is dead. Well, I'm still alive. But you know what? There has been an identity change. Your old nature died at the cross. And I've said it before, but it's worth repeating because there are so many churches that don't preach this. You don't have two natures fighting against one another. And I'm, I mean, I've, I've heard 
so many people trying to teach, well, you have to struggle and fight against the old nature and it's the old nature against new nature. That is not biblical. Your old nature died at the cross. You are a new nature as righteous as Jesus. And I'll repeat it again because I know that our ego can't accept it. It's not your righteousness anyway. It's God's righteousness that he has put on you. But it, so God sees you as righteous as Jesus. That's why Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation because he sees you as righteous as Jesus. At the cross, the most important words that Jesus said at the cross was, It is finished. He did it all. Anything you add to it is subtracting from, He did it all. So it is not. He plus me is all him. That's what grace is about. Not because I deserve it. None of us can deserve it. But it is by fact that we don't deserve it. That's what grace is all about. For God so loved the world. That means you and I. I mean, how, what an overwhelming love. That God could love imperfect man. But I, I've told you before, the whole purpose of creation was for to create the bride of Christ that we may, may live in constant union with him. It is a love affair between God and us. That was the whole purpose of Jesus coming to the cross. That the bride may be redeemed, and we may spend an eternity with him. So we need to understand that who I was died. And so he says, not I, not my old nature, but Christ that lives in me and with Christ is my new nature, as righteous as Jesus. And so The spirit of God that indwells us talks to our spirit, our new creation, and communicates the thoughts and intents of God to us that we may walk in accordance with his precepts, in accordance with his desires. And as you commune with him, here is the interesting thing, as you commune with him more and more and more, His desires become your desires. And the manifestation of God becomes alive in you. And is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but I need live totally different now. I live a new life. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh and I've said it before, flesh in the scriptures means the soul primarily. But you could say the soul and the body. We are a three-part being according to 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 5, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit was all that was recreated when you came to Christ. Your old spirit, the old nature died, you received a new nature as righteous as Jesus, and the Holy Spirit of God came to indwell you, and he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So you are a new creation in the Spirit. However, we live in a body that still gets old, and sometimes it aches, although Jesus paid for that at the cross. And we'll talk about that at some time at length. But it is finished, in Q, includes not just salvation, but healing and deliverance is included in that also. But we live in a body which is aging, which ultimately will die unless Jesus comes while we're still here, and which will rot in the grave, but it's going to be recreated, and we will rise up on a new body incorruptible forever. 
And we have a soul which is also unredeemed. That soul is composed of three parts. Is, is mind, will, and emotions. Mind, will, and emotions. And we talked about that at length when we were studying Romans chapter uh, maybe six months ago. So the question of why we still sin after our Christians is because of the soul. It's because of that mind, will, and emotions. And I told you, the, the mind is like the greatest supercomputer that there is. Much, much, much more superior than the biggest computer that exists. Every experience in your life, no matter how old you are, you can recall. And unfortunately, there's a lot of bad programming in our minds. Through experiences, through what we watch or hear or see, and those experiences can cause you to walk astray. This is why Paul said, walk in the spirit and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. And the more we commune with the spirit of God, the more we spend time with him and in his word, the less influence the flesh, our mind, our will, our emotions, Will, will have upon our walk. So it is, uh, what are you watering? Take two potted plants and water one and don't water the other one. What happens? The one you water is going to flourish. The one you don't water is going to wilt. Well, we need to water our mind by the washing of the water of the word, by the word of God. We need to be in the word of God. We need to in the word of God. We need to meditate in the word of God. And I've said it before. Meditating is like a cow. You chew on the word. You chew on the word. You chew on the word. You get as much use as you can. Then you internalize it. And then you bring and chew on it some more. And you get some juice out of it. Internalize it and then bring it up again. And keep on chewing on it. And as you meditate in the word. The desires of the flesh are subdued. Because what you focus on is what that mind is going to be uh, moving along on. So we need to, in order to walk in the spirit, we need to spend time with God. And I'm not talking about two minutes as you get out running to pick up a coffee at a drive-in and you just go for two minutes. Give me, 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 give me. In the name of Jesus, amen. And that's unfortunately the prayer, so a great majority. No, no, no. Prayer is about communion. And the more you commune with him, the more his spirit will take control of your life and you will walk in the spirit. And things that, and uh, let me tell you one thing that will happen very quickly when you walk in the spirit. Things that used to irk you before. Don't face you at all. I mean, you got upset because there was a cloud on the left-hand side instead of the right-hand side, or who knows what. But when you are communing with him, the peace of God, which Philippians chapter 4 says that surpasses all understanding because it's a peace independent of circumstances, that peace fills your heart. So what happens is as you walk, in the spirit one the desires of the flesh are subdued they don't really bother you it's like an arrow that comes and hits a metal wall and is deflected and so nevertheless I live You're not I but Christ that lives in me and you focus Christ is in me as a matter of fact let me ask you a question. I, I am sure all of us have heard thousands of times, thousands of times. You see it in the word. Jesus Christ is in you. And he said it repeatedly. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But how many Christians believe it intellectually? 
but don't believe it in the heart. Because if we truly believe that Christ is with us every second, we would act differently. But the problem is it becomes a mental ascent and not a reality in the spirit. See, we need to internalize it. And it needs to become a knowing that I know that I know that I know that Christ is in me. I'm never alone. I will never be lonely again because Jesus Christ is with me. So Christ in me, the hope of glory, needs to become a reality. And I know I'm harping on this, but it's so important. This is the secret to a victorious Christian life. That you walk with a consciousness that Jesus Christ is in you. And so he says, nevertheless, I live, but yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And then he says, and the life that I now live in the flesh, the life that I now live as I walk to my, in my daily affairs. And I love the King James in this. The new King James says, by the faith in the Son of God. The King James says, by the faith of the Son of God. I've looked at the original language. And in the original language, it is the faith of the Son of God. Even the faith is His faith that He puts in you so you can walk in His faith. Wow. So, I mean, there's no excuse. Well, I don't have any faith. Well, it's His faith that He's put in you. What's your excuse? We love to come up with excuses for our shortcomings. When really, we are complete in Him. And the more we believe it, the more it becomes a reality. Am I making any sense? Yes. So, so the life that I now live as I walk around in the mundane world that we live, His faith is guiding my every step. And you know what will happen when that Psalm 1611, one of my most favorite verses. In his presence, there is fullness of joy, delights forevermore at his right hand. As his presence is manifested in your life, as you are aware of his presence in your life, you will find two things. One, joy unspeakable will fill your heart regardless of the circumstances. And uh, let me tell you one good way that you can uh, test that. When you're coming to work in the morning in rush hour on the highway and somebody cuts in front of you, what comes to your mind? That's going to be a good test as to where, where are you focusing. And uh, sometimes uh, I'm not going to ask you what comes to your mind or what you or what you externalize or what you shout out the window, but it depends on what are you focusing in. And so Christ in you will manifest itself. Number one, when that happens, you will be filled with joy, regardless of the circumstances. You know. Joy and happiness are two entirely different things. Happiness is totally dependent upon the situation. Joy is a characteristic of God. As a matter of fact, when we get to chapter 5, we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And the second manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Second in priority to love only, joy. It's totally independent of your feelings. It's a joy that comes from above. And that person that cuts in you, you can smile at, God bless you. Oh, Father, Lord God, give him understanding. Reveal yourself to him or to her. And now your disposition is totally different. And the second thing that happens when you are communing with him is not only that joy. But peace. Oh, do you remember that old song? I got peace like a river. Regardless of the circumstances. This is why Philippians 4.19 calls it a peace that surpasses all understanding. 
because it's a peace totally independent from the circumstances. Don't you want to walk in joy and in peace? The answers are simple. Commune with him. Immerse yourself into his presence. Pray as you drive. Although I encourage you, pray with your eyes open when you're driving. <laughs> but, you know, just focus on him. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. Just, and, and I'll tell you what happens. Your life will become so much more pleasant as you walk through the day. Your work day will appear like you're on vacation because you will love what you're doing, even if you hated it the day before, because you're doing it like Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, whatsoever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. And you do it to please him. You know what? That jo job that you hated, all of a sudden you love what you're doing because you are doing it as unto him. And so your disposition will change dramatically. And this, the third thing that will happen, and this is so exciting, is others will see Christ in you. Others will see Christ in you. And, I, and I've mentioned it in, in the past that I can tell when I look around, I can tell about people that have spent time with Jesus because I see it in their countenance. You know, you read in the Old Testament that when Moses came down from the mountain after spending 40 days with God, his face shone. And it shone so much that he had to put a veil over his face. Well, I'll tell you what, I see face, faces shining all the time. And as you walk in the spirit, you will see the glory like I see it. And I see it exuding. And it is a living testimony. And people will stop you and say, hey, what is it that you have that I don't have? How can you have that? I mean, that smile is not just the lips that are smiling. Your heart is smiling. How can I get that? And you become a living testimony even without opening your mouth. Because the joy of the Lord so fills you that it will spill over. Remember Psalms 23? My cup runneth over. Well, we need our cup to runneth over. It needs to be spilling to those around us. That's what God wants for us to be. That when you walk into, the, into a room, people know something is different because Jesus just walked into that room. And I'm not being sacrilegious. If you know Jesus, when you walk into the room, Jesus walks into that room because Jesus is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, the problem is we say it and maybe we believe it in the head. But the question is, do you believe it in your heart? And you, you just need to let it become a reality, a reality in you. And then that joy will never leave you. And then others will recognize you. And you will attract others to you because of who is in you, which means you will attract others to him. And you fulfill the purpose that God has put you on this earth. And it's just, it's just so exciting. It's just so exciting to say, oh, Lord God, use me to your glory. And it happens without you even trying. I mean, it's not this thing, well, I just couldn't go out there and stop somebody and say, hey, do you know Jesus? You know, most of us feel scared about doing that. But the thing is, you don't have to. If you fool Jesus, you will attract others to you. And they will want what you have. I mean, I remember when I came to Christ, what, 47, 48 years ago, I was invited to a Bible study. And honestly, I don't even remember to this day what the Bible study was about. What impressed me was the people. And after the Bible study, they had a time of prayer. 
and everybody made prayer requests. And what shocked me is all these people had problems. And in spite of their problems, they had a peace that I couldn't understand because I had no peace at all. And it was that manifested peace in their countenance that showed me they have something I don't have and I need it. That was the testimony. It wasn't even the Bible study. I wasn't paying attention to the Bible study. I went because somebody invited me. I couldn't say no. I went reluctantly. But Christ in them, I saw it. I didn't know it was Christ, but I knew how. I mean, there was a lady in that Bible study that lived alone with her son. And her son would beat her to get money for drugs. And then yet this woman had a peace. And I, would, I was thinking, how can she have peace when she's living in, in a living hell? That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so I encourage you, just fall in love so much with him. Commune with him so much that his presence will manifest in and through you without you even open your mouth. And you smile, and it's the smile of Jesus moving forward. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is it possible? It's not only possible, I see it. I see it. And you ought to be able to look at the mirror and see it yourself. And it should encourage you. And it comes only one way, as a result of spending time with him. I mean, it's not a one-time affair. Oh, I was saved 17 years ago. And uh, have you opened this book since then? Well, you know, I, I'm too busy. So I, I, I dust it every once in a while. But, you know, I, I, I remember years and years ago, before I even knew Christ, that there were homes, and this was so common. You walk into a house, and they had a humongous Bible. I mean, it probably took two people to lift it. Open in their center table. They never read it, but it was open to their center table, and they dusted while I dusted the furniture. That don't do any good. You know, it doesn't come by osmosis. You can't just take this book and put it under the pillow and sleep on it and have it all of a sudden. Be, no, 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 no. You got to read it. You got to spend time with him. He is, we are the bride of Christ. We need to fall in love with him and just, just want to spend time with him. Remember when you were courting? Didn't you want to spend all the time with a young man or young woman you were courting? Well, Jesus is courting us all the time. We need to spend time with him. We're going to spend an eternity with him. We better start practicing now. You know, as a matter of fact, there's a book that I read many years ago by Paul Bilheimer called Destined for the Throne. And Paul Bilheimer said that our life as Christians here on earth is training for eternity. Training for eternity. Let's start practicing what we're going to do in heaven all the time. Let's start loving one another as someone who Christ died for. That person that you hate, that person, Jesus Christ, went to the cross for that person. And we need to love them as Jesus loves them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace, for your goodness, for your mercy, Father. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you will make this a reality in our hearts in our minds father that we may realize that lord god when we surrender our lives to you and receive the sacrifice of jesus for ourselves oh lord god your son jesus christ came to live with us oh father may we be so aware that he will never leave us he will never forsake us may we live in a constant awareness of Christ in us, the hope of glory, Father. Help us to be self-conscious of your presence, Father. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, glory to God. We covered one verse. That's good. Only. But that's okay. Uh, and, you know, this struggle, this struggle between the flesh and, and the spirit, the problem is that if you do not truly know that you know that you know that your old nature is dead, you're going to think that the struggle is life. It's just what it is. But it's not what it is. It's not what it is. This is why he says, I am crucified with Christ. Who I was died on that cross. And you need to, this is why it's important for you to memorize this verse. Repeat it to yourself daily. I mean, I wasn't kidding when I said, take the time to memorize the scripture and internalize it because it's not just memorizing a few words, it's the message of those few words. And they're becoming a reality in your spirit where you walk knowing that Christ is walking with you. We need to be constantly aware that Christ is in you. You know how many, how much that will, how much more pleasant life would be if before you open your mouth to insult somebody, the thought comes to your mind, Christ is in me, the hope of glory. And that insult all of a sudden becomes a blessing. You think that's going to change the response of that other person? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you're not aware of Christ, you're just aware of the circumstances, you're going to lash out like you did before you knew Christ. And don't call it the old man. The old man is dead. Call it your flesh. Your flesh. The old programming. No, no, no. We need to renew that programming. That's why Romans chapter 12 says that we are to renew our minds by the washing of the water of the world. We need to be renewing our mind by the word of God. It is the word of God that is going to make that cassette change. All right. So it's it needs to become a total, total reality. You became a new creation when you came to Christ. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation or it could be translated a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is why I, I was talking to Carlos a little while ago. And I said, you know, I was an alcoholic. I won't say like the alcoholics anonymous. Say, I'm an al- no, 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 no. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a new creation in Christ. I was a drunk, but I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. I'm a totally different person. Who I was ceased to exist. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So, let's go to the next verse. Galatians 2.21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And this just brings it home. Listen, if I could achieve this right standing with God on my own, then why did Christ go to the cross? Why did Jesus have to come and go to the cross for me if I could do it on my own efforts? The reality is you can't. But you see, here is where religion does so much harm. Because religion is do's and don'ts. You got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. And the more of the do's you make, the better your flesh feels. But you know what? Sooner or later in that list of do's and don'ts, you you flop. Because the more you do, the more you realize you need to do. And it's a constant struggle. And it's a constant disappointment. And it's not life abundant. It's life in a struggle. And I mean, you know, if you go back to the... uh, the Old Testament. You know, it wasn't just 10 commandments. There were 613 commandments. 
I mean, I don't even know how you could remember them all. And so when you keep on doing and doing and doing and doing to earn favor with God. Now, let me clarify this. Nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are a wonderful moral code. I mean, obviously we shouldn't murder, murder anybody. You shouldn't lie. I mean, there's a, you shouldn't commit adultery. But it's a code of law. It's not if you do these things, you're going to achieve heaven. As a matter of fact, when you look at what Jesus said, if you look at someone else with loss, you've already committed adultery. If you're angry at somebody, you already committed murder. What was Jesus saying? Listen, nobody can keep it. Nobody can keep it because the heart without Jesus is despitefully wicked. And so, because it's the old nature. It's the old nature that came from the devil. So, it's, you got to realize, if, and, and unfortunately, I know churches that they say, yes, you're saved by grace, but you have to be kept saved by works, by what you do. Well, my question is, how much works is enough? How do you know you've arrived? Well, the reality is you never arrive. And the reality is you live under constant condemnation to a set of rules. But you know, if you look even in the Old Testament, if you look at the, in the book of Jeremiah, God says in the last days, I will put my spirit upon you and I will write my laws in your heart. You see, when you are aware of this new creation, when you are aware of this new spirit in you, as righteous as Jesus, doing the right thing becomes just your normal behavior because it's flowing out of your new spirit. And that's what he meant by, I will write my laws in your spirit. Because his spirit is in you. You have a new spirit, a new creation as righteous as Jesus, so as you walk in the Spirit, you will be manifesting those right works, not to earn favor with God, but as a manifestation of who you are. Do you see the difference? You don't do the good works to earn favor with God. God doesn't love you any more or any less if you do it or don't do it. I mean... That's just not the nature of God. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. That is his nature. He loves you because that is his nature. Has nothing to do with your behavior. If you think God will love you more for your good behavior, you're mistaken. If you think God will love you less for your bad behavior, you're mistaken. That's not biblical. He loved you so much that when you didn't deserve it, he went to the cross to die for you. Romans 5, 8. In this is demonstrated the love of God for us. In what? While we were yet sinners. Not after. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not because we deserve it. It is in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. So we need to understand Oh, it's wonderful to do good works, but not to earn anything with God. We do it as a manifestation of the new creation in us. Am I making sense? It's not out of duty, and it's not out of avoiding a baseball bat over your head. It is out of a flow. Remember what Jesus said, those to the woman at the well, those who drink of the water that I give them, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, out of their bellies shall show rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. That is the flow of the Spirit of God as you realize Christ is in you. And you operate, you manifest what's in you. And it ought no longer it becomes out of duty to earn favor with God. 
that's the problem with religion. That's the problem with religion. And unfortunately, I've heard preachers say this statement verbatim. Well, I, I can't preach pure grace because that's a license to sin. And I said, how much ignorance? Well, I have to preach that you have to do and do and do because otherwise I'm giving them a license to sin. Listen, if we understand the new creation, you understand you're a new person. Your wants change. You desire to please him. If you're walking in the spirit, you will always desire to please him. You delight in his presence. And so the good works may come a manifestation of who you are not to earn a position with God. Do you see the difference? And this is why I say religion is the biggest enemy of Christianity because it keeps you in bondage to doing instead of being. See, you are doing to trying to become who you already are and you can never get there on your own efforts. So it's a life of constant frustration. So allow Christ in you to be manifested in and through you. And you will experience that joy, that joy unspeakable. Oh, I'll tell you, I could just stop here and just rejoice and praise the Lord because he's worthy to be praised because his riches are unthinkable. The riches of his love and his love is poured on our hearts constantly. And you need to just let it flow out of you like rivers of living water and spill onto those around you. And you know what will happen? You will become like a magnet. People will want to be with you, will want to be around you. Why? Because the joy of the Lord spills and touches others. And we fulfill our purpose upon this earth to become the manifestation of Christ upon this earth. See, others will be attracted to Jesus when they see Jesus in you. Even without saying a word. Even without saying a word. I mean, you need to long for the time that somebody comes to you and says, Hey, I don't know what you got, but I need it. How do I get it? Without you even saying a word. Can that happen? I see it happen all the time. Look at the faces of those who have spent time with Jesus and you'll see it. You see it. You can see the manifested presence of Jesus. I'm seeing it as I look around this room. And uh, it's what God desires. That we become an extension of him. To reach a lost world. I mean, uh, the other day I was talking to somebody and I, and I said, look, let me ask you a question. Why doesn't the moment we receive Christ as our Savior, why doesn't God just zap us out of this world and take us to heaven? Why leave us here? What's the purpose of leaving us here? It's only one purpose. So we can be his witnesses. So we can be his hands, his feet, and his mouthpiece. So that he can reach others through us. See, God is all-powerful. God is all-present. God could do everything by himself. But he chooses to operate through us. What a privilege. What a privilege that God has made us his instruments to reach others. That's the only purpose we're here on earth, that we can be a manifestation of who he is to someone else. There could be no other reason. I mean, why have to put up with, with rush hour traffic and, and storms and everything else if there's no other purpose? Why not just go to heaven and graduate to his presence and joy forever? Because he wants to reach others through you. He wants you to manifest his glory. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord God, may we receive this message. And may we walk out of here and just be like shining lights. You know, Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 5. You're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. What are you doing with your light? What are you doing with your light? Are others seeing your light? They can. It's got to shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. We taught little kids that. Maybe we ought to sing it ourselves. And let that light shine in and through us. I'm having a private revival here myself. <laughs> hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God is so real. God is so real. And if you just dare to receive that, that he is so real and he is seeing you and you become self Conscious of his presence all the time. I guarantee you, if you can become self conscious of his presence at all times, your life will radically change for the better. And the peace and the joy that I just talked about a few minutes ago will become a constant reality in your life. So if you're struggling, if you are walking with a black cloud over your head, this is the message for you. Immerse yourself in him. Just abandon yourself into his arms. And just worship him. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God of my salvation. I exalt you, Father. I glorify you, my Lord. I worship you, my King. Glory to your precious name. I can't help but continue to worship him. Oh, his presence has been so manifested here today. He wants that presence to be manifested in you all the time. All the time. Not while we're sitting around this table for an hour. 24-7. 24-7. That even when you go to bed, you are just overwhelmed by the presence of God and by the joy of God. And I'll tell you, you will have the most pleasant sleep and the most pleasant experience knowing that God is communing with you. And he's communing with you all the time. Just receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. I'll tell you, I, I just feel that I cannot go any, any longer. I'm just looking at a scripture. Let's just take some time and, and worship God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, Father, you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. I exalt you, my Lord, my King, my Master, my Savior, my all. Glory, glory, glory be unto you, O oh, Father. Thank you, Lord God, that for that love brought Jesus Christ to come upon this earth. Thank you, Lord God, for the promise of your Holy Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory, you said, Father. Oh, Lord God, manifest. Make us all aware, totally aware of your presence in our lives. And, Father, manifest yourself in and through us, Father. Let your glory, let your glory overwhelm us, Father. Oh, Father, let our lips be sanctified unto you and let your blessings come out of our mouths as we speak to others, Father. Make your presence be manifested in our countenance, Father, that others will know we've been with you, Father. Make us magnets, Father, to attract others to you, Father. Oh, Lord God, use us to your glory, Father. Oh, Father, I worship you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to my King. Glory to the Lord God of my salvation. Oh, exalt him, glorify him, worship him. He is worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord God. 
Blessed be the name of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord my God. Hallelujah to King Jesus. Oh, Father, I exalt you. I glorify you. I worship you, my King. Glory to your name. Glory to your name, O Lord God of my salvation. Thank you, Father. And thank you, Lord God, for that love. That love that brought your son, Jesus Christ, to go hang on a cross. Totally man and totally God. Without sin and yet, Lord God, you loved us so much that Jesus took upon himself all of my sins. All of the sins of everyone upon this earth. Even those that shake a fist at God. Thank you for that love, Father. It's incomprehensible that you could love us so much. Even when we hate you. And Lord God, you poured upon us your wrath, your justice, your judgment for our sins, Father. And every one of our sins was judged in the body of Jesus. And thank you, Lord God, that Jesus cried out, it is finished. Thank you, Lord God, that you received that sacrifice as full, complete payment for our shortcomings, for our sins, for our aggression, for our antagonism towards you, Father. And Lord God, we can rejoice that you received the payment and the payment was enough, was complete, was your justice was fully satisfied because you raised him from the dead. And he sits now at your right hand, Father. I encourage anyone that is listening to my voice, if you do not know Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, right, confess it. Oh, I believe that Jesus Christ died for me, took all of my sins upon himself and became my substitute. And thank you, Father, that you raised him from the dead to justify me before you. I declare right now, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I speak blessings upon each and every one that is with me today. I encourage you to look to him, the author and finisher of your faith. I encourage you to spend time in his word and realize that his word is alive. That is God speaking to you and allow his love to fill you to overwhelming, to just fill you to much that it will spill out into those around with around you and you will be, begin to touch others with the love of Christ. Thank you. I encourage you to be with us next week. Next week is Easter week. So next week we're going to take a pause from the book of Galatians and we're going to talk about Passover and Easter. We're going to talk about the cross and about the resurrection and we're going to go beyond the traditions that we experience at, at Easter. And so I encourage you, please do not miss next week. Thank you. God bless you. And I expect to see you next week. That's Tuesday, 12 o'clock Central Standard Time. Thank you and God bless.